All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're just, we've just gone live on Facebook, and uh, we've also opened up the Zoom meeting as well. So I can see that we have quite a few people starting to funnel in. Uh, I do know it can take some time for people's connections to boot on. So we're just going to take a moment or two here to relax and get comfortable. So if you're already in here, please feel free to go get yourself some water or some tea, pillow for your back, whatever you need to just sit with us and be comfortable for this next hour. Um, we'll plan to get going once I can see that the uh, Zoom numbers start to stabilize, but we're continuing to climb for a bit. So just give me us another 15 seconds or so. Okay, it looks like we've stabilized a little bit. So let's get rolling. Um, I'm really excited because today's webinar, Building Equitable Outcomes in Early Childhood Education, is by, well, well, basically, it's impossible to meet, meet new people in the midst of this pandemic, um, but I'm really glad to have met our guest speaker, Kim Desmond, in this time. And I'm really excited that she um, has volunteered her time to uh, share her expertise with us all today. Um, first, though, just so we can get this stuff out of the way and get straight on over to the notes, uh, for us hosts, my name's Michael Taylor. I serve as Early Learning Ventures Outreach Manager and as your chat, chat moderator for today. If you or your organization is unfamiliar with Early Learning Ventures, we're a shared services nonprofit that specializes in providing one-on-one -on -one relationship-based support to providers. And that's primarily on the business and admin side of things. Uh, we run a child care management system, Alliance Core, that can help with all manner of things, billing, attendance tracking, compliance tracking, record keeping, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and it's all taught within the partnership model of shared services. Um, I like to highlight that we've implemented some pandemic-related updates to our system, including the capability of touchless sign-in and sign-out, and then also uh, temperature and health checks per public health ordinances. Um, I'll include some links to get that over to me if you're interested. If you're not, but you're interested in these kinds of webinars, we do this several times a month. Um, and you can follow us on Facebook. We do these webinars one hour, a um, couple times a month, and then we do industry in, interviews with industry folks weekly. Um, so please feel free to follow us. Uh, finally, before I introduce and hand it over to Kim, I wanna highlight just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, our post-webinar messaging will be coming about 30 minutes to one hour after this webinar concludes, and it will include a copy of today's slide, a recording of the talk, and some information about ELV. Uh, second, if you are attending this on the Facebook Live side of things and you have questions during it, uh, please feel free to use the comment section. Um, my teammate, Milena, is over there monitoring that. If you're in the Zoom, please feel free to just use the chat and I'll be monitoring that as well. Okay, time to introduce Kim. So Kim leads a very, very busy life in her day-to-day uh, -day role with um, the mayor's office. But with us, she is the CEO of Desmond Ray Consulting LLC, which focuses on training organizations and individuals on equity. Really thankful to have her here with us. So I'm going to stop sharing so that she can Take us away. Thank you. Thank you, um, Michael and Melina, for um, this opportunity. And thank you to Early Learning Ventures for the opportunity to talk about my work. And early education is actually my, my passion. I actually have a background and degree in early education. And so most certainly, it's always a pleasure to be able to do this work and talk about um, early education. So. Definitely, which is why I do the consulting work, is to really keep my hands in what's happening in the early education arena, as I believe it's the, the, a, a large opportunity to be able to impact families and in, in our, in our kiddos. And so looking forward to talking about building equitable outcomes in ECE. And so by way of background, born and raised in Denver, uh, again, I have an early education background, as well as a policy background, as well as an education administration background. And so all those things basically mean that I like doing work that really impacts the humanity of people to provide opportunities and address any racial disparities. And so that most certainly has been the theme of my work. I do wanna start out before we get going is to 
it's always important when you're having conversations around equity and inclusion to do a land acknowledgement. And so I want to do a land acknowledgement. And I, I hear that we have a lot of folks here from around the um, country. I hear we have some in Texas. So hello to my Texas folks. And not, Michael, what other cities, but just shout out to all the folks who have joined us here in good old Denver, Colorado. So to start out um, with the land acknowledgement, um, I want to, as we gather here for this session and this conversation, I want to make sure that we're able to reflect and learn and grow in our awareness of the past future in our current state and how it informs how we work towards these outcomes. I want to acknowledge that Denver actually sits on the land that originally belonged to Arapaho tribe. Not only that the land belonged to Arapaho tribe, it also is the land of our original um, indigenous um, First Nations folks, Apache Nation, Cheyenne Nation, Pueblo tribe, Shoshone tribe, and Ute Nation. And so, um, they were here long before us and let us acknowledge the contributions currently as well as the um, contributions in the land ownership in the past. So you can give me just a quick 30 seconds to acknowledge and reflect on our contributions of our indigenous native folks. Thank you. And as Michael stated in the intro, this presentation is in the context of my consultancy. And so I do a lot of work with consulting in the early, with the intersection of early education and centralizing what it means to be equitable in that space. And so just know that that is something that I do. And so just that's the context of this particular presentation. I will be in, as well as Michael and Elena looking at the chat box throughout. And so please feel free to block trap your, um, your questions in. And so we are in this panel to where I can't see any of you. I'm looking at Michael and Malena. And so I can't see what your expressions are, your thoughts. And so I hear your thoughts. So please make sure you're using that chat function if you have any questions for me throughout the presentation. And also I'll leave plenty of time for you all to interact with me personally to ask any of your questions. So we're going to start with, um, I want to frame this conversation in that we're talking about early education and equitable outcomes, but I want to frame it in talking about all the things in the systems that revolve around our families that we serve. And we know that um, our, our students and our children come within family constellations. And so I want to make sure that we're talking about when you're building equitable outcomes, what is surrounding that? How do you build inclusive environments to create those equitable outcomes? And what is the role that diversity plays in more importantly, talking about what role does our systems play, in particularly systemic racism, structural racism, and the impact to our, um, our families that are navigating. So you will hear me use some terms today, just to clarify real quick. The term is BIPOC. So you will hear me use um, BIPOC as a way to refer to our Black Indigenous people of color. And so I want to just put that in the space as I'm referring to the context of equitable outcomes and impact um, to our families. And so with that, um, most certainly I'm going to um, look at how this connects to in Colorado. I know you're in Texas, but in Colorado, we're looking at our Colorado Early Learning Development Guidelines. Like, how do you keep moving the work when you're adhering to different um, guidelines to make sure that our, our kiddos are getting what they need in those different age bands, right? So just wanted to give you that uh, setting the stage. So that's going to be the flow of this presentation is that I'm going to start out talking about equity, clarify some key terms gonna move in talking about systems of inequity, um, systems of racism, and then gonna really broach it in talking about our um, early learning and development guidelines and what that means for the work. So with that, I really would like some participation. So in the chat box, um, this is a way to get you engaged and interacting with me as the um, presenter. I would like for you to take some time in your chat box or even pose some questions as I have that option as well. How do you define diversity? I want you to also define equality. So in your chat box, make sure you put diversity colon what the definition is so that way you're tracking as they all come in. So in the same thing for equity and inclusion. And so um, I would love to call in the space some of the way in which you see the work 
And so please take this moment and use your chat function to define these terms. And I would love to see what that looks like. And there's no right or wrong answer. And so just know that I really am genuinely looking for what you all are thinking. So someone please, we have 57 participants. And so I'm sure that some of you all have had some thoughts around how you define diversity. So um, I will give you a few minutes to tap those things in so we can start reading them out. Thank you to our first respondent. Um, the practice of involving people from a different social and ethnic background, social economic status, culture, gender, and sexual orientation. Thank you for that comment around how we define diversity. There's verity in that, verity in that. Thank you so much. Diversity is connected to difference in culture, traditions, um, physical attributes of individuals. Most certainly individuals are diverse. It's including people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds. And of course, sexual orientation, gender, et cetera, et cetera. What about equality? Let's get some responses in there about equality. Oh, I got some inclusion. Inclusion is that all people, regardless of their diverse backgrounds, gender, race, abilities, religion, backgrounds, um, that they're included. Yes, we have to include um, people who are living with disabilities, people who are living with disabilities. I use that language purposely. I have a colleague who does a lot of work with our people who are with disabilities and she's always making sure that we use person first language. And so thank you for reminding us to put in the chat box, people who are living with disabilities. Thank you for um, equality, equal opportunity for all. You're providing the same thing for everyone. And so, for example, if you're having a, a, a lunch or a, a gathering, you may provide um, turkey sandwiches to everyone, but not everyone eats turkey. So that would not be equality. Equality is given the same thing regardless of any difference. Ensuring everybody has equal opportunity and is not treated unfairly or discriminated against. What about some equity? Let me hear some equity definitions in here. Equity, giving people what they need, the, the chat jumped up on me, give me one second, giving people what they need to obtain the goal, even if it means one gets more. So you're tailoring, so in ECE, you're like, in early education, you're individualizing, individualizing what the individual needs and not everyone needs the same thing. Equity is fair. Equity is the quality of being fair and impartial. Equity is providing different levels of support so that everyone is starting from the same place. Equity is having the ability to, to equal opportunity. And please keep them coming. We'll, I'll keep doing this throughout. Like this is in this um, world of COVID-19, um, we're looking at these screens. And so I wanna make sure I'm interacting with you all out there from where you're at. So, so let me ask you all, um, I wanna just throw, throw a, a term in there. Has anyone ever um, defined the word anti-racism? Can anyone take a stab at defining anti-racism, what that means? And to preface this, you will see a lot of work right now. Um, Dr. Ibram Kendi, I'm a huge fan of um, his prolific um, contribution to this field. And definitely he's done a lot of framing around what is anti-racism. And so really wanna put that in the space. Inclusion, false ownership of belonging. Thank you. And we'll keep digging more into this. And so I'll be checking for if someone can plot me a definition of anti-racism. I gave you a little, um, a, a little, a little cheat where um, Dr. Kendi, you can most certainly find a way that he defines it in his latest book around how to be an anti-racist. And so this, this part of this presentation is to purposely um, anti-racism, removing race and opportunity um, in the discussion of thought. I wanted to purposely set the um, the set some do some level setting 
um, to make sure that when we get into talking about early learning and equity outcomes for um, students, that we're really understanding the things that revolve and connect to making those things a reality. And so um, purposely, there are different ways that folks talk about different terms. And so for this presentation, we wanted to do some level setting as we really get into how do you actually move and go towards the outcomes that are really driving ECE. So as you all see here on this slide, you all most certainly gave all those different types of definitions. And so we have most certainly, um, it's any, any difference, there's a difference. Everyone is diverse. And so sometime in organizations, they may say things like, um, I've had as a consultant um, partners ask me, hey, we want diverse people. And I say, well, you must not have any people because everyone is diverse. The question is, what type of diversity are you talking about, right? So sometimes we use diversity as a way to, um, it's, it's a way of to like not say what we're thinking in terms of we're looking for BIPOC, people of color. We're looking for um, that whole um, demographic around our people of color are not represented in the organization. So there are some organizations who may not have um, BIPOC representation in their um, higher level management positions. And so when they say diversity, I say we're all, we're all diverse. What are you looking for? Let's label it. Because if you're not diverse, then you have no one in your organization, right? Because everyone has a unique layer. And also those layers are interconnected. You don't just leave one layer out of the room when you walk into the space. So for example, um, my pronouns is she, her, hers. I walk into a room with my pronouns. I walk into the room with being a black woman. I walk into a room with those spaces being the age that I am. I'm 15 years old today, right? You all wouldn't know that. I got started earlier, right? And so you walk into a room with all your layers of who you are. And with that, the question becomes, what do you do with that, right? So you look at then equality, you all provide it, providing the same example, regardless of the individual need, inclusion, it's an action. You're actually doing something with inclusion. inclusion. You have to make sure that people are able to contribute and co-create in a very authentic, intentional manner. Inclusion does not look like you already have the plan in place and you're saying, here's the plan, I'm giving you two choices, pick one of the two. Inclusion looks like I'm able to co-create what options are coming up in that plan. And so inclusion, if you're doing inclusion work, you're actually doing something and you're including the folks who are impacted based on their layer of diversity, right? So just that's one thing to sit with in that space. And I see here, um, anti-racism is working to, from, you gotta shout out Jennifer Garcia on the phone, actively working to dismantle systems that are racist. And so we're gonna get to anti-racism. We're gonna keep moving towards that one. That's gonna be the next um, leg of slides. But for um, equity, equity is an outcome. There's a lot of organizations and folks who are saying that they're doing equity work. And there are two questions that I usually ask you doing equity work. Um, how do you define it and how are you measuring it? How do you define it and how do you measure it? And so if you're doing equity work, you should have a clear definition. There's various um, renditions of um, the way that folks define equity. And so the one that I use more accurately for me in my work is that a race, equity is include when a person's racial and ethnic dimension of diversity can no longer predict social determinants of health or outcomes in our systems like education, in our systems like housing, transportation. And so this includes the elimination of historic policies, practices and attitudes, and messages that reinforce differential outcomes by race and ethnicity. And so looking at equity work is looking at really doing disparities-based work and you can measure it. And so um, the reason why me getting into early education is that I really wanted to be a part of addressing the learning gap. And so we do have a gap here in Colorado with our, our kiddos, our BIPOC kiddos, where reading and math, there's a literacy gap, there's a math gap. And so that's where you know there is the absence of equity when you see that disparity by race ethnicity. We're all living through a pandemic right now. Um, anyone um, can get the pandemic, but what we're seeing is that our BIPOC folks have higher um, percentages and rates of death and hospitalization. And so that's um, racial inequity in our health system. And so in our country, we have never seen true systems of equity. And so there's always been housing inequity, education inequity. And so that's why the word equity is so poignant. 
And so I like to believe that if you're doing equity work, you get to diversity. Because to do equity work, you gotta make sure you have the folks there. So I actually like to lead with equity work and then um, pivot to how am I including people? What does inclusion look like to make sure that diversity is leveraged? And so you have seen some of these image, images on the internet, internet flying around. And so you have like some of the classic ones where you have equality, where it's the same, um, you see the, the people here in a, um, at a game and you have like the boxes and you give the same boxes to everyone to see over the fence, right? Not paying attention to the fact that our, our, our kiddo who is a wheelchair user, so you hear that language, you're a wheelchair user, you are not wheelchair bound, you are a wheelchair user um, and there's no access to that, right? And then you see here where you have equality, equity, and liberation, where you may provide a tailored approach to making sure the individual um, who is a wheelchair user, who is also living with disability, gets what they need, right? And you see the kind of same thing with this, this tree image slide, um, very gendered, I can say that in this slide, because these are things that I put from the site. And so just thinking about equality of sameness and really getting to, we talk about equity, there's justice. It's producing the outcomes where people don't have resources, where they're able to get what they need. Another question of inclusion could mean that I even want to go to a soccer game, right? Um, there's been images with no fence, no fence. And so with inclusion, you may ask the question, do you even want to go to a soccer game versus thinking I want to go to that type of game? And so that's where you have the pairing of um, equity and inclusion in terms of being tailored, but being included with an inclusive way would have been to ask the folks in the picture to say, where do you want to go? How are you going to get there? And what do you need? See, that sounds differently. Not that you can respond, but I thought I would ask. And I'm looking at Michael. And so as we look at this slide right here, just a quick reminder that our identities are dynamic, they're interconnected, they're intersectional. And just check the language there where I said our identities are intersectional. I did not say intersectionality. So intersectionality is when there's a collision of oppression based on your dimensions of diversity. And so we see that with our BIPOC folks. So for example, um, if you are a white woman, you can experience um, sexual harassment misogyny, all those things. If you are a black woman, not only do you experience misogyny, sexual harassment, you can also experience racism. So intersectionality really is about talking about the collision of your identities and how they're interconnected and how you are interfaced with disparities or discrimination based on that. So I use the word intersectional because our, our, our identities are intersectionally connected. And when I talk about intersectionality, I'm talking about the collision of oppressions based on those things. And so with that, as we look at and unpack who we are, to go back here, who we are based on these dimensions, the intersectional dimensions, it's important to think about how that formulates an experience. And you, that experience then creates a perception. That perception then formulates a belief. And this is where you have to be careful at in that your belief can lead to assumptions and racial stereotypes. And I purposely um, called out racial stereotypes to talk about racial disparities as we're segueing into talking about racism to really get about what that means for our work. And so thinking about who you are is a huge part of the work and where you come from. And so you can't pick if you were raised in a home where um, or in a city or a town. I went to school in a town in Kansas where there were very few BIPOC folks. And so a lot of um, my um, people who I went to school with, they did not have a lot of interaction with BIPOC folks, right? So growing up, they didn't say, hey, um, parents, I wanna live in Hayes, Kansas, move me here. So really digging deep to say, what is my experience? Because I formed it in a perception. That perception can form a belief. I do some training too around different types of biases they connect to this, so that, that's where I accentuated the work around assumptions and racial stereotypes that emerge as a result of your experiences. We all have biases. If you say you don't have biases, I will say that is not a true statement. I have biases, we all have biases. It's a matter of what kind of biases and how they're interacting with our experience and our belief system. And so with this, uh, I wanted to show the, the how, how powerful, how powerful our perception and our belief system is. 
when we believe something is important based on our experience, we are likely to twist things in ways that support those beliefs. I know I do that all the time with my siblings. If I believe something, you cannot convince me that I'm wrong. Like usually I know I have my um, largest disagreement if it's a values um, conversation, because I will, I will literally um, martyr myself in ways that will um, make sure I behave in ways that are consistent to those beliefs. And these things are called self-fulfilling predictions. And so with that, it's being conscientious of the types of um, racial stereotypes that emerge in this space. It's being conscientious to say that we also, based on those assumptions, there's a part of it also where we hear and we read selectively that is in ways that are, it is important to us to maintain those well um, long perspectives. This is the way that we operate. And so more certainly when we believe something, um, we most certainly will martyr ourselves and to make sure that we are fulfilling those beliefs, even if we may um, have a different opinion. And so just know that's a part of this work is sometimes people can have a belief, but act in ways that are, that are, that are counter to their belief system. And we're seeing that happening around the country right now. You're seeing folks who they're getting recorded doing something and then they're like, hey, I'm not racist. And so what happens is that you can believe one way and act accordingly if you have not really checked your racial biases or your assumptions or your stereotypes. And so with that, I wanna jump in right now to talk about racism. So when we talk about um, racism, there are different types of racism. So in front of you, you see um, institutional racism. And this occurs within and between institutions. It, it, it's really most certainly discriminatory treatment and unfair policies and equal opportunities that impacts that are based on your race ethnicity. And they are perpetuated in our institutions like schools, our health systems, education. And they happen also between individuals in these institutions. And it's also a strong power base that goes with this as well. And so most certainly, there is a disadvantage based on if you are a BIPOC person in terms of the impact. What I like about Dr. Kendi's work though, he also talked about the ideology of racism so that we can, all, we can all have racist ideas and thoughts and still be a person of color, still be BIPOC. And so we're gonna unpack that so when we get to that slide. So with institutional racism, just giving you some examples of that redlining. So um, even if you're in Texas, whatever city you're in, there's actually a redlining project um, I don't have the link here. Maybe I can give it to Michael to share it out with you all. But you can look at like the historic neighborhoods. There was an actual government policy that took place in the 1930s throughout the country where based on your race, ethnicity, you were told you couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. And there were policies that reinforced that. So that really then resulted in how wealth was increased, more particularly how wealth was increased for our, our white folks. And so redlining was a real government policy and we see the impact to that policy now. As a matter of fact, in Denver, some of the, um, the neighborhoods that were originally redlined neighborhoods, which basically meant you could not live in a certain neighborhood. Um, you were told if you were a BIPOC person, you can only live in certain neighborhood placements. Then we see the same neighborhood demographics currently in our city here in Denver. Oh, look at somebody in there. Thank you, Katie. Katie popped that in there. Katie's quick. Thank you. I don't know Katie, by the way. You would have thought I knew Katie, pop that in, thank you. And so racial profiling, stop and frisk, most certainly um, are, are, are examples of institutional racism where you may have a policy where um, we have broken window policies that we're taking around. We've had other things to where you see a, a disproportionate impact for our black, our, our BIPOC folks. And so getting to this next part is individual racism. So these are most certainly actions that we perpetuate based on our race ethnicity. These things can most certainly be very explicit. Um, they can be unintentional. And these acts are still also racist in their consequence, right? And so some examples of that most certainly that we see playing out are racial microaggressions. These are those subtle slights, those subtle comments or behaviors that really are meant to demean a person based on their race ethnicity um, being a BIPOC person. Signs and symbols, um, words most certainly are a part of that where you're actually able to see an individual writing something, doing something, saying something as an act of that. Then you roll into structural racism. And with structural racism, um, it refers to the accumulation 
So what happens with all of that? And so if you look at it in three different ways, you have the systems and the structures, institutions, schools, health, the places where you go, you go to your dentist, you go to your doctor, hopefully you all can go get the vaccine. I'm rooting for you all educators. Um, those are institutions. Structurally, there's an accumulation of the outcomes, which is why equity is so important. With structural racism, you see the outcomes are an accumulation of historical and cultural things that are result connected to racism. And these produce chronic adverse outcomes for our BIPOC folks. So that's important to distinguish. Structural racism is the accumulation of inequity. It's the numbers of um, the percentage of our kiddos who are reading in math remediation, right? So these things structurally is the accumulation of the numbers part, which is why equity is so important. Pardon? Structural racism and equity are so an important complement in that when you talk about structural racism, you talk about equity because you really want to tackle the outcomes in it. So that's key to you as, as um, early learning practitioners, whether you are a teacher a practitioner an administrative staff, looking at the outcomes that you're seeing in your work, it could be in your child family and development services in your referrals to parents. Um, it could be in things like helping parents search for housing opportunities. Home ownership, most certainly there are racial ethnic disparities in home ownership um, around the country. So that's an example of structural racism. And so giving you some, some things that go with that, mass incarceration, um, right now we're, li we're, we're living through history and action. Right now there are seismic catalytic conversations right now, moment by moment about different types of racism and people are tired of systems not serving BIPOC folks. And you're seeing a seismic um, conversation around what this means. And so um, organizations are literally hiring folks to do this work. Um, they're um, building their capacity to know what it means to work that muscle around equity and inclusion. And so seismic conversation around addressing um, the things that we see not only with mass incarceration, but with the policing and with the killing of um, um, our BIPOC folks. And so lots of names you can throw out here in Denver. We have some of our own, Elijah McCain, we have Brianna Taylor. These are all names that come up, the list goes on and on. And so just know that there's seismic conversations around no longer being complacent or indifferent or silent when talking about inequitable systems. And as a matter of fact, people are recording it and people are losing their jobs. People are um, getting charges. These are real things that are happening and we're living through it right now. And so I talked about home ownership. There are most certainly um, structural racism was embedded in policies like our GI Bill. When our soldiers came um, home, um, we saw a disparity in um, our soldiers who were white getting more um, home ownership, homeowner support in suburban neighborhoods would actually prompted the accumulation of wealth generationally. So an example of that is connected to historic to currently structural racism. And so really want to put a pin here and thank you all for sharing some thoughts on what it means to be anti-racist. And so you see Dr. Kendi's face, I, I, it was up recently on the whole New York's, one of those little fancy light buildings, I don't know which one it's called, but just know that this is most certainly a seismic conversation and Dr. Kendi is in the center of it in that the way that he has defined it is that to be anti-racist um, is to think nothing is behaviorally right or wrong inferior or superior with any of the racial groups. So breaking that down in, in ways that are consumable for you all is that essentially you're not associating negative behavior with a person based on their racial group. Um, whenever the anti-racist sees individuals behaving positively or negatively, the anti-racist sees exactly just that, individuals behaving positively or negatively not representing a whole race. To be anti-racist is to de-racialize your behavior and your perceptions, to remove your racial stereotypes based on your experience to the slide I showed, to make sure that everyone is seen as being a part of our human tapestry. And so to be anti-racist is to have a way, it's a way of thinking. And so Kendi's work is so paramount in that as a, as a black woman, I can carry an ideology or a way of thinking around racism. This is so important to distinguish. If I'm working with kids or families, we've been socialized 
to see our BIPOC folks as inferior and superior. And so when you're working with families in your, um, in your arena, think about how some of your racial stereotypes are swimming in your head. And so that can happen regardless of your race ethnicity, you can carry the ideology of racism. There's another part of being an anti-racist. Number one is ideology, the way you think about inferior, superior, and associated with racial ethnic groups. The second part of being anti-racist is in your polity. It's in your policies, your practices, your procedures. Our, um, our country was founded on um, systemic racism. Therefore, um, this country um, is racist explicit in the way that we have written policies to leave out in other, our BIPOC folks. And so when you're being anti-racist, it means you're critiquing and changing your policies and your practices to ensure that they're not riddled with racial disparities. You're ensuring that you're not creating policies and practices that are othering and marginalizing um, folks based on their racial groups. It means you're addressing disparities which connect to equity. And so I'd like to think about anti-racist in appearing to equity to where if you're doing true anti-racist work, you're ensuring equitable outcomes occur. And you're being inclusive to make sure you're involving the diverse folks who it impacts. And so you, this is so important as we move into the next part of this presentation. As you're doing your work and making your plans, and I purposely started with the foundation to say, you cannot get to doing the work around building competencies and guidelines that are associated with early education without being clear how these things impact that. When parents walk into your centers, um, your centers, your schools, your home sites, know that they're bringing and they're carrying the systems with them. And those systems can be riddled with systemic racism. Or they are riddled with that. And so it's being clear about that. So as you're providing the service, unintentionally at times, you can be perpetuating the thinking of someone being defined as inferior. So it's important that as we go into this next slide, you hold in your mind that like to do um, equitable and build equitable outcomes in early education, there's an understanding foundationally that needs to occur around how our systems revolve around the constellation of the folks who we serve. So you'll hear me now as I've done some level setting and feel free to chat some questions in the question box or the Q and A thing here, Michael, I'm seeing. Um, let us know if you have any questions as I'm going through this. The next part about this work is that equity, right? So when you look at anti-racism, you see the definition here, what does it mean to be equitable? So when you're building equitable opportunities in early education, make sure you define it. A lot of folks have not defined what their equity criterion is. An equity criterion is most certainly a simple way for you to define what type of variables are you going to measure. And so one of the first things that inspired me to be an ECE, I remember getting a report. Um, I used to, I'm a, I still have my large center director's license, which is hilarious because I haven't operated a center in like years, but I keep getting it updated just in case I have to go operate a center. Um, we were, I was looking at a report from our linguistic specialist in our center. And I will never forget, she was counting and talking about the level and number of utterances from one of the kiddos in our infant classroom. And we were talking about it in the context of saying language development, and we were looking at and measuring the utterances for infants. And then you traverse that to language development for our toddlers, right? So there are precursors to learning and development that you don't just start reading because you wake up one day and you're in third grade, right? That doesn't happen. Prior to third grade, there were all these different milestones that took place that really scaffold your development to get to be able to read at a third grade level, which also infirms if you're gonna graduate and what that means for you to be reading and doing math at a ninth grade level, which is why your work as early education um, folks are so important. You're the foundation. But I wanna be clear to say this, our family and our parents, they're the main educator. Our family and our parents are main educator. So when you're doing equity work, you're thinking about what are the variables? And so in ECE, it could be all the different things. If you're using teacher strategy goal, you're gonna go to some of those things here next. You wanna identify what kind of data that you're using. You wanna identify how you're gonna measure it. Because if I ask you, if you're saying you're doing equity work, what I'm saying to you is what are your outcomes? How are you measuring it? How have you defined it? What is your criterion? 
And so some of my work that I do with ECAE um, organizations is around providing that coaching to say, I have organizations say, you know, we're doing equity work. And I say, what's your criterion? How are you measuring it? What are your variables? How do you define it? So with that, as we go in now, we have that foundational context. I want to spend some time here real quick to connect it to our Colorado early learning guidelines in that these are the things that are so important and foundational for our, our kiddos. We have the domain of physical development and health. We have social development. We have emotional development. We have cognitive development and approaches to learning, language literacy development. And so you all pay critical roles in that. If you're using teacher, teacher strategies goal, your observations, your class observations are key in looking at where children are at in these domains. So want to really make sure that you're differentiating like from zero to three, these are the domains that we're operating in. And then you move into thinking about like, what are the things that come up between zero to four? That's actually one of my favorite age groups. Um, I'm not gonna lie, like zero to four, they're just, it's just the zero to four thing, it just warms my heart. And so they're, they're learning by seeing and touching, right? And it's a significant impact to the way that their language develops. They're communicating through their senses, right? And imitation begins to build in their connection to others, right? And so I'm just visualizing some of the, um, I haven't had a, my, my grandmother, you, we used to call them new babies. I haven't had a new baby in our, in our family in a little couple of years. And so just new babies are most certainly connecting through us with our senses. And then you move into our age demographic of our 48 months, right? And this is, I'm, I'm only gonna highlight a few domains because in Colorado, the standards are like very lengthy. And so um, looking at the physical development and health domain, perceptual development. And so when you think about being equitable, you wanna make sure that when you're being equitable, you wanna make sure that like, you're talking about what is the measures and the equitable outcomes you want to see around large muscle movement and gross motor, fine motor. And fine motor using those hands. And you wanna make sure that when you're saying being anti-racist, that means you want to maybe make sure you have a policy where you're not requiring every kiddo in your class to use a fork. Because culturally, not every culture uses silverware, right? And so you want to make sure that you're not seeing um, a, a deficit in a place that's not culturally placed. And that's where the connection to anti-racism is so keen. And so you want to make sure that you're able to connect these things and that you're able to advocate and say that culturally, where is this kid's this child's development, and am I having a cultural position lens? I can't read, comment, and talk at the same time. I'm trying to. Thank you, Kelly. Um, also health, maintenance of health and growth and physical activity, um, routines, development ability to understand and participate in professional um, personal care routines. You may have a parent who, if they're living in a neighborhood where there's a lot of traffic, to go and give them activity and say, hey, do a lot of um, physical activity with your kiddo and there's no nearby park. Understand that there are some neighborhoods based on redlining where there's not a walkable park within two miles, right? And so that's where you talk about um, being anti-racist and understanding that there are systemic barriers that impact the physical and health development of our kiddos. And we see this with the pandemic, right? Um, there are some folks who are essential workers and they cannot find someone to watch their um, four to eight month year old while they have to go out and work at King Supers or um, work in our construction spaces. So there, this is in all connected context and the same thing for social development, interaction with adults, developing the ability to respond and engage. Think about how all of these different domains, if you're being anti-racist, you're thinking about the systems and the context and you're thinking about building equitable outcomes as you're looking at the guidelines. Relationship with peers is happening between this time and it's through interactions over time. Empathy and developing what that means in relation to folks. And so most certainly kids are starting to also to see that and understand it in their communication, their emotional expressions. 48 months, we're continuing that with our um, the way that we have our recognition of our ability to develop our actions and influence our environment, the way we express emotions between that time frame, our impulse control, 48 months, language literacy, so our receptive language. Again, all these things are within a cultural context. So the, the slide that I started with is your experience, your perception, your belief system, 
your receptive language is in the same context. And so if you're giving a child an assessment and there's no cultural context for the way you're measuring their receptive language, then you may miss something, right? You may miss something. I had an assessment recently with my nephew actually. And um, he was saying, they showed me an anchor. And I was like, anchor? I'm like, what have you seen an anchor? And he said to me, he said, I couldn't recall what it was called. And I said, don't feel bad because you couldn't remember the word anchor. But when is the last time this child, I watched Deadly as Catch. And so I know what anchor is, right? And so think about like that, like your cultural context has everything around your understanding of receptive expressive language. And you can unintentionally create a policy that is racist uh, unintentionally. So these, these are things that that connection back is that when you're creating ways to assess receptive language, expressive language, communication skills and knowledge and interest in print, you gotta do it in a cultural context because if not, you unintentionally perpetuate systemic racism. You see, I said that unintentionally. I'm not saying purposeful, unintentionally. Your intention still has an impact. There's a difference. Intention and impact are two different things. And so with that, same thing with cognitive development. So you're getting the drift here, right? Number sense, classification. So as you're traversing your many ways of work. So if you're in Texas and you have state guidelines in your early education standards and your observations, make sure you're being conscientious of the ways in which you're assessing the kids in these areas. Not only in symbolic play, memories, attention, all these pieces, make sure you're working and understanding what that means. The same thing for our four to eight months year olds, the curiosity, that's what I miss about working in the classroom. I would go in and, and, and I recall going into the classroom once asking a three-year-old, where does chocolate milk come from? And the three-year-old politely checked me and said, chocolate cows. I said, I know that's right, chocolate cows, right? And so notice that's happening with that age, especially our three to five, you have this, these other domains that are expansive where you have like social studies, knowledge and skills, math, language, um, all these things are a part of um, understanding that when you're doing equitable work, look at these guidelines and domains and make sure that you're clear about how you're assessing so you're not perpetuating racism. And that you're clear about being equitable in the domains to build those equitable outcomes in ECE. So that's the connection point, right? You can't get to the outcomes to be equitable outcomes if you don't understand how the apparatus and the powerful force of how racism operates. So with that, I'm gonna bring us to a closing to open up some more questions for you all to bring it back in. Um, understand that our families are the main educators. They're the main influence of their children. You are a visitor in their life. And as you're visiting their life, don't come with, do not come with um, racist ideology. Do not force on them um, racist policies and practices by way that you're assessing and evaluating. And also do not pathologize our families. There is nothing wrong with our families. There is nothing wrong with our families. Don't regard or treat them as if they are abnormal or unhealthy. Difference does not mean deficient, it's just different. And so when our families are coming into this space, I want you to label the systems and not say that because you are a BIPOC person, it's your fault for these disparities. It's the system's fault for creating condition for those things to exist. So don't pathologize people, name it accurately and know your role in this work. So I will stop there to open up any Q and A. And so Matthew, Michael, I don't know how you wanna do that. Um, we have 10 minutes on an hour. So we'd love to hear some of your questions and thoughts. Um, I'll start reading things, Michael, and I will let you all, how do you wanna, Melina, how do you wanna do this? Um, I figure what we'll do is we'll just wait to see if any questions come in. Um, you have been a wonderful moderator for yourself. I don't really need to do too much, uh, but um, I'd be happy to read them out if you want. We got somebody saying that they absolutely love the difference does not mean deficiency, just different. Um, I think for another definition, just from our work with you, would you mind sharing just briefly the concept of othering. I think that was pretty impactful for a lot of folks in our organization. Yes, yeah, so I've been some training with early learning venturing and Professor John Powell, I'm a huge fan of his work. 
um, othering and belonging. And so othering, um, based on your layer of diversity, sometimes we other folks in different spheres of our world. And so whether it's government spaces, government spheres, public spheres, nonprofit spheres, corporate spheres, othering basically means that you have placed someone in a position to where they don't get opportunity based on who they are. So othering essentially looks like creating a policy to where, let's say you have a school and you have a new school and you have a, a, a kid who is a wheelchair user, check the language, and you don't have a ramp. You have othered that kid to have access to the building, right? So, and there are laws that prevent that, but actually people are getting sued because they don't adhere to the laws. Like there are all out Department of Justice lawsuits around like ADA accessibility. That is still happening today. And so othering means that you have provided a lack of access and equity and inclusion for someone based on their layer of diversity. Belonging means it's in line with inclusion. I'm creating a space for you to be able to come with identically who you are and co-create to the things you need. So Dr. John Powell talks a lot about othering and belonging as a um, way to contextualize doing equity work. And so definitely something that's um, key. If you'd like, I can just read them if you'd like. I see another one that um, just came in, which is a very quality one because uh, <laughs> One of my favorite quotes by Bertrand Russell is, everything is vague to a degree you do not realize till you've tried to make it precise. And with that in mind, for uh, those providers that may not have considered targeted equity work, what would be a good first step for them? So, you know, I, I, Michael, I'll be completely honest with you. I start reading the chat box and I didn't hear <laughs> No worries at all. One more time. Could you give an example of a first step for a provider that may not have considered targeted equity work before? Um, yes, yes. The the thank you, Michael. I'm not going. I'm at the age where I can just say I didn't hear no you said. And so, um, I would my advice would be to start out with saying how do we define it, and where are we trying to move to as an organization. Um, sometimes it's about asking the questions and not always um, trying to get the the um, the answers done first ask the question, say, hey, we want to do equity work. How do we start? How do we define it? Start there, start there. And then you start to answer things like, how do we prepare our staff? And how do I prepare myself? Like equity work is a, it's a lifetime commitment. You don't just go to work and walk into your job and say, I'm doing equity work. It's the way you live. And so start there. Any other questions you want to read for me? Yeah, yeah. What might you say to non-BIPOC folks who say, I don't see color or I'm colorblind? I would say that race and ethnicity is a socially constructed, created um, construct, but it's a very real social and political construct. When you go in a store and you look for a t-shirt and you pick out, I know sometimes I have shoes that want to match my shirt. You say that shirt is red. When you say you don't see color, what I hear is that you don't know how to talk about the social and political construct of race. It means that your experience has not have uh, created an opportunity for you to interact with it means to be a person of color who where your race is always in your face. Like me, I can't hide that I'm black. I walk into a room, I'm black, right? Now, black is not a real thing. It's a social created construct, but my experience interaction with the world has been based on me being black. And so to someone who says that I'm colorblind, I would just throw out a factual policy and say, if, you're, if, if there was a such thing as a colorblind world, then why have we have policies that prevented um, um, black folks and our BIPOC folks from living in certain neighborhoods? It's written in the constitution. So you, it, right, you could just give them very factual things um, in that space, but really just unpack that people just don't know how to talk about it. That's really the, the trepidation. There's anxiety with talking about racism. And so color, people who have colorblind ideology, they don't know how to talk about it. So I would say start there and inquire more and do more probing. We'll say there is a, I think everybody can see in the chat, but uh, thank you, Jennifer, for once heard a cool statement. If you don't see colors, you can't see patterns. That's a nice succinct way to go about doing it. Um, one thing that I think is important to also talk about, um, which you just touched on briefly, is that this is a, um, a constant um, thing that you're always learning. And um, so would you just talk with people that might feel 
a bit uncomfortable diving into this work. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. So would you mind just people with that mindset sharing a little bit? I would say, I don't think we do enough in our workplace settings to cultivate two things, vulnerability and grace. Vulnerability and grace. Like when you cultivate vulnerability in the workplace, it's being able to create an atmosphere where you can say, there are things you don't know, things you don't know. So when you cultivate vulnerability, you open up an opportunity for people to learn. So I would say that in this work, vulnerability is needed. Be okay with what you don't know. I learn something new all the time with equity work, all the time. And so cultivate vulnerability and then give grace, give grace based on where people are at and what they need to learn. Cause those are key parts of it as well. So vulnerability and grace. Wonderful, thank you. Most of the things we are having come in are just thanking you for being an awesome speaker, which I already knew, but it's nice to see it again. Um, I do wanna just leave it for another couple seconds if we have uh, any other questions um, come in. Uh, so, I mean, I'll just share comments that are coming in since I know that some of these are not available to everybody for individuals on the phone or something like that. Um, you know, it sometimes feels like there's a devaluation of the beauty our diversity brings to the world, which, uh -huh. yeah. And then uh, we've never had equitable systems in our country ever. We have to be open, vulnerable, and learning that it will take time to get there. Yes, we got to. And it's okay to be open and vulnerable with that. Um, it's okay. It's okay to do that. It's okay to be able to stay, just be open, vulnerable to learning. And most certainly just, I will say, just try to do something that makes a difference and understand that um, your own, I call them equity gaps, understand that your own gaps in your own learning and your own assumptions. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Um, I'll be closing it out here in a moment. Uh, I do see that we have a lot of thank yous coming in your way. Um, so, you know, I know that was a bit of a final thought, but do you want to give your final, final thought and then we'll Yeah, my final thought. I thank you all. I thank you. You are charged with the most important job next to our doctors <laughs> in the world. It's caring for people. When someone brings you um, to, to, it's a treasure to care for someone's child. It's a treasure. That's your most trusted gift that you're given. And so I thank you for um, caring for the entrusted gift that is granted to our families. So I thank you. You do it every day. EC work is some of the hardest work I've ever done in life. I've never worked as hard um, in my life than EC work. So I thank you for that. And take care of yourself. Take care of yourself, be healthy and keep doing the work because I see you. I wish the world would see you in terms of the compensation part in the ECE, that is a thing. And so, but I see you and I thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. Oh, uh, one thing that I neglected to mention in the beginning, uh, for those individuals that are um, providers and needing to get their 15 hours, this will um, count as an hour of training. Um, we'll be getting those either to you either Monday or Tuesday of next week. Um, so stay tuned on that side of it. And we thank everybody for attending. We thank you for being here, Kim, and we'll see you soon for our last session. <laughs> Take care. Have a good one.